session of uh, uh, the plenary for today. Our plenarist is uh, Brad Nelson, and uh, we are going to start very soon. We will start at 10.25, so in one minute. Okay, good morning to all of you. This is Domenico Pratichizzo. I have the honor to introduce uh, the plenary of uh, today, but before introducing our plenarist, let's start with the short video from the sponsors. Shape the future with E-Series. Le grandi conquiste si fanno insieme. Intellimec, il consorzio intelligente per la meccatronica. Well, it's for me an honor to introduce Professor Brad Nelson, that is our plenarist for today. And Professor Nelson has been a professor of robotics and intelligent systems at ETH, ETH Zurich since 2002. And he has over 25 years of experience in the field of robotics and has received a number of awards in the field of robotics, nanotechnology, and then biomedicine. He serves on the advisory board of a number of academic departments and research institutes across North America, Europe, and Asia. And he is one of the editorial boards of several academic journals. Professor Nelson is with the Department of Mechanical and Process Engineering at ATH and has been also head of this department and the chairman of the ATH Electric Microscopy Center and a member of the Research Council of the Swiss National Science Foundation. He also works and serves uh, in uh, three Swiss companies uh, and is a member of Swiss Academy of Engineering. Before moving uh, to Europe, uh, so Brad uh, Nelson uh, worked as an engineer in Motorola and Honeywell and also served as a United States Peace Corps volunteer in Botswana, Africa. He has also been professor at the University of Minnesota and the University of Illinois of uh, uh, Chicago. So very impressed by the curriculum of uh, Brad and I'm uh, um, uh, very active in following his research in uh, medical robotics, micro robotics, and uh, I'm really, really uh, happy uh, to introduce his talk on uh, micro robotics and nanomedicine, future direction in medical, in medical robotics. So thanks again uh, to, to Brad, and uh, we can uh, start uh, with uh, his uh, talk. Here we go. Hello, um, I'm Brad Nelson, the Professor of Robotics and Intelligent Systems at ETH Zurich, and thank you for the opportunity to speak. Today I'm going to talk about microrobotics and nanomedicine, future directions in medical robotics. This is work that's been going on in my lab here at ETH uh, over the past 18 years when I first arrived in 2002. First, let me tell you a little bit about uh, my lab um, and about uh, ETH. ETH were loaded, located in the heart of Europe in Switzerland. Um, we're a bit small country, about eight and a half million people, so much, much smaller than, uh, uh, for instance, China uh, and or the U.S. Uh, um, but I think uh, we have a, a, a strong reputation in science and technology uh, with some quite famous uh, graduates, uh, quite famous professors coming from ETH. You recognize, I think, the person up there on the right who was a student here and also a professor here. I think in the latest uh, world rankings, we're, we're consistently ranked in the top 
uh, universities in the world with uh, over 22, with 22 Lobel laureates that have come from us. My team here consists normally of around 40 people uh, focused on, on science and engineering. We have engineers, uh, research scientists, um, administrative staff, um, and we've had quite a few people through the lab over the years. We bring in a, a broad set of skills. We're primarily robotics, but we work in micro nanotechnologies. We work in biomedical engineering. Uh, of course, we have electrical engineers, computer scientists, even medical doctors and business people that help us. And uh, my lab here um, is focused uh, over the years on, on kind of four areas. Uh, we, we first started working in micro manipulation. Uh, and uh, microassembly. That's when I, I started as a professor in 1995. And, and uh, in a few years uh, of that, I realized the importance of being able to measure forces at small scales while manipulating small objects. And so that led to a lot of work on, on developing force sensors for uh, micro and nano scales for manipulating and handling small objects. And also, we worked a lot with biologists on, on characterizing the mechanics of biology, this area called me mechanobiology. Uh, when I moved to ETH in 2002, we started thinking about what was going on in the field and what would be interesting to move into, and we started thinking about how we might build micro and nano robots. And so, um, um, that got us uh, focused on trying to build small autonomous devices, and as we did that, we realized we thought magnetics, magnetic actuation was the way to go there, so we started developing a lot of expertise in the field of, of um, um, generating magnetic fields, magnetic field gradients. But a, a fundamental part of what we do is materials and fabrication, making small things. So I have a uh, work with a, a professor, Professor Pani, who's a chemist uh, closely. Um, he's an um, important part of, of the lab here and runs a group focused on materials and fabrication. And that has helped us uh, be able to realize a lot of micro robots that are, are a challenge to, to build. Um, as we've worked in this field of micro and nano robotics, so, um, it, the applications we see are in medicine. And so we became quite interested then in this field of medical robotics. And that's where a lot of the work that's been going on in the past several years have been in, in medical robotics. And medical robotics, if you're not uh, very familiar with it, is, is, is exploding, to be honest. It, uh, uh, it, it, the biggest uh, success story has been intuitive surgical out of, uh, out of California. Um, they have over 5,000 of their robotic surgical systems uh, located in hospitals around the world and have performed more than 5 million um, operations with them. But there's also been uh, other companies, for instance, Oris Health, um, um, Mako Surgical, uh, Mazor Robotics, a number of companies have brought products to market, have been acquired by larger companies. And so there's a lot of interest from investors uh, and from large companies in moving into this space. Uh, what I think is, is quite interesting in this space recently has been, first of all, in the COVID uh, crisis, the COVID development is, is there is a, a need people realize in separate ourselves in. But even before coronavirus, we saw some very interesting trends in the field. Um, and, and I mentioned a company before called Oris Health. This is a company that <clears throat> produces, uh, is interested in endoscopy and, in, and remotely controlled endoscopy. So what you see here is about a four millimeter uh, sized endoscope with a camera on it being remotely controlled by what looks like a, 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 an Xbox controller, quite, quite similar. Uh, remotely by a surgeon. Their main uh, application they're looking at right now is bronchoscopy going into lungs, but of course this, can, this same endoscope can be used uh, for exploring other parts of the body, such as the gastrointestinal tract. Um, intuitive Surgical uh, is also developing what we used to call the smart catheter system, which is now called the ION system, and also looking at uh, um, smaller and smaller devices. And this is the trend we see is in this field is seeing smaller and smaller endoluminal devices that are guided 
um, remotely along more torturous paths. We think that's quite interesting, but there's a physical limit to how small these devices can be. They all have pole wires in them, so there's, they're, they're stiff. They have wires inside that cause them to bend um, in two degrees of freedom. They can bend in, 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 in the two planes there uh, as they're pushed forward. And those pole wires provide uh, just some fundamental limitations in stiffness and friction. Um, so we think the next trend uh, in this field is going to be making these catheters or these endoscopes as small as we can, and then eventually releasing devices that are untethered that can be then moved into position, for instance, to uh, deliver a drug to a remotely located tumor uh, to reach a, a, a thrombosis uh, somewhere deep in the brain that we can't get to. Um, and uh, so, so this is what we call micro robots, small devices that are able to be autonomously controlled deep into your body. Um, and so that's where a lot of where we've been going. And so I mentioned earlier when I was talking about my lab about the importance of uh, magnetics and magnetic actuation has been a key technology that's of interest to us. Um, and so I want to spend just a little bit of time going through the physics of, uh, of magnetics, pretty, pretty straightforward, pretty simply. Um, there's two ways you can use magnetic fields. You can use the field or you can use the field gradient. With the field, we can generate torques, and with the field gradient, we generate forces. And just to visualize that, uh, this is uh, the torques are generated sort of like a compass needle. If I put uh, a magnetizable body, something that's made out of, uh, say, iron or nickel or neodymium iron boron, um, in, in a magnetic field, that uh, body will want to align its north and south poles with that field. And so then by moving and adjusting uh, the direction, the orientation of this field, we can generate torques and cause, cause these bodies to move. Um, on the other hand, with, with forces, forces are generated a little differently. They're, they're generated as these fields get stronger and stronger. Those, as those flux lines come together, it shows a higher density field or a stronger magnetic field. Um, and, and that causes our, uh, our, our, our magnetic body, or you can imagine this could be a, a, a micro robot uh, that's magnetizable uh, to move in that direction. And so um, about a decade ago or so, my group was able to, to consider this problem from a robotic standpoint. And we developed a system we called the Octomag. It consists of um, eight electromagnets. You see them here in this picture. Uh, and we were able to formulate the mathematics of that in a way that was quite similar to the way uh, robot uh, manipulators, robot arms are, are formulated. Uh, instead of having joint angles or velocities as inputs, though, our inputs are the currents going through each of these individual coils, and then through a mapping that contains uh, magnetization of the material that's being controlled, the micro-robot, uh, uh, as well as its position in the workspace through this mapping, uh, we can then determine what forces and torques are generated on that. And so, so this gives us uh, uh, two capabilities here when we can formulate it like this. First of all, it brings in about uh, 50 years of robotics control research on how you can address this problem. And it lets you do two things. It lets you figure out how to optimally design your robotic system for uh, maximizing the torques and forces uh, that you'd like to see in some way. But it also then, of course, allows you to control those very, very precisely. And so we spent a lot of time over the years building magnetic manipulation systems. And, and this gives you some of them. The very first Octomag we, we built uh, 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 came together in September of 2009. Um, it's a, a device we've used for small animal uh, experiments. Uh, we then, uh, right after that, got the idea of making them smaller so they could under microscopes for uh, microbiologists to work with and so people can actually interact mag with magnetic rods and, and particles uh, in complex ways. Um, because one of the things that our, our system allowed us to do is very precisely control these small devices with five degrees of freedom. And the five degrees of freedom, I mean, are translation in X, Y, and Z, and then rotation about two of those axes. The uh, rotation about the center uh, axis is something that's uh, a, a, a bit of a challenge with these kind of systems to do, and we don't usually have to do that anyway. But we're able to, for the first time with our approach, show this kinds of, of, of um, uh, a very precise control of, in this case, this, this uh, device is probably about a millimeter or so in size, but we've gone down to, uh, to less than 10 microns for control of these kinds of devices. So we've gone from this uh, kind of small animal system to a, test, to a, a, a microscope system. We also 
uh, started building a large system. This is our, our first system for doing large animals like, uh, like pigs. Um, and then that turned into a clinical system. So this is a, a system in a hospital outside of Zurich here that can be used for humans. Um, and then as we've uh, gone into this further and farther, we've also started going back smaller and more portable systems. And our most recent system is the Navion. We'll talk a little bit about that more. And this is a portable electromagnetic navigation system that can be wheeled in and out of an operating room um, to be used if it's needed or the operating room can be used uh, uh, normally. And so this is just some of the, the, the effort we've been working on over the years building these systems uh, so that we can control our micro robots. Uh, so one of the first things as we, as we started working in this field, we thought about was, well, what are we going to do with these? Where in the body? And we became interested right away in ophthalmology for a variety of reasons. And the idea was that we could somehow drive small devices within the ocular cavity to the retina to help treat retina, a variety of retinal diseases. Um, and so we've taken that quite some ways. Uh, um, and here's our, our Octomag uh, designed for small animal studies. Uh, this is one of our micro robots that is uh, small enough to fit inside of a 23 gauge needle that makes it about 300 microns in diameter. Um, and then it can be injected through the sclera, through the white of the eye into the eyeball that doesn't require a suture to, to close that puncture. So it's a, a sutureless puncture and can be released there um, and do perform things like deliver a, a drug to the retina to treat, for instance, age-related macular degeneration, or it could be used to uh, perhaps help block a clogged retinal uh, artery or vein. So this is a, about a hair size vein. It's about 125 microns in diameter. You see it, our device kind of floating right above it, right above the retina and, and puncturing in these cases. So we continued down that path, spun off the company in this area and are still interested in pursuing uh, um, activities here. Uh, but we started thinking then, well, what else could we do? Uh, what other parts of the body might we work in? And so one thing that became interesting to us was looking at the heart. Uh, we talked with some uh, um, cardiac surgeons and we're thinking about uh, particular diseases and, and an electrophysiologist who worked on, on treating heart arrhythmias was interested in, uh, in our system. Um, and we realized, well, we're not going to be able to, to have small robots swimming around in your body, in your heart. They would get flushed out right away because of, of the incredible um, uh, uh, fluid flow uh, that's going through the blood flow uh, through the aorta. Um, but if we uh, took our micro robots and connected them to a tether, um, we could still use the same kind of mathematics. Of course, it's what was really is, is a, a magnetically tipped catheter. Uh, and by changing then our, uh, the direction of these fields and controlling them, and again, using that same mathematical framework we talked before, it would allow us to uh, 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 very precisely control these catheters uh, within the heart of a patient. And, and this is, again, as I mentioned, to treat the heart arrhythmias. Uh, uh, certain certain um, people, many, in fact, all of us suffer from some type of heart arrhythmias, usually at some point. Sometimes it gets as bad that people actually have to take medication or go in and have a surgical procedure. And so this surgical procedure is done while the patient's awake and the surgeon then guides the catheter to ablate uh, tissue um, to try to fix the electrical connections that are, are not, that are kind of going haywire wire in the heart. Um, and so this turned into our AN focus. Uh, it's a, a system um, in two halves that can come apart. It's controlled by a joystick uh, so that the surgeon is removed from, you see a fluoroscope here, that x-ray radiation is uh, in low doses is safe, but if you're doing this all day long as a surgeon, you, you, you don't like to stand next to it if you don't want to. And so by removing the surgeon from that, it's safer for the surgeon. Um, and also, uh, um, provides benefits in manipulation of the catheter to the patient. And so here's the system. Uh, first, the clinical installation outside of Zurich here. You can see the system is, is in, pulled apart in halves. It, it's on rails and comes apart. The patient is lying here uh, and being prepared. Um, then the system comes together uh, with the patient inside. And uh, this is where the, the surgeon's sitting, uh, sitting back here, uh, removed from the harmful x-ray radiation and the patient ends up uh, by themselves in there. And you can see a catheter and, and the dexterity with which we can guide these catheters in, in here. So uh, um, here's an example of one, of one of the patients that were being treated by this. Our, our medical advisor, Dr. Duro, is, 
is looking at her, uh, this woman's right atrium and planning where to do the ablation up in that particular chamber of the heart. This is a local doctor who's being trained with the system. Um, and then they're actually performing this uh, with uh, the patient by herself uh, away during the procedure. Um, at this case, we, we've done seven of these procedures. Uh, we've we found a lot of interesting things. First of all, the system functions very reliably um, and user training is essential. Um, um, when we developed this system, we were using commercial off-the-shelf uh, medical catheters that uh, were produced, and we found that those were not ideal for treating atrial flutter, which was one of the cr critical disease, major diseases. Uh, this is where the, the uh, uh, catheter had to move over into the left atrium. Um, so we, we started working on catheter development. Um, and we also realized as we worked with hospitals, the system's too large, it weighs over seven tons and requires a dedicated room. And that makes it a challenge to integrate into clinics. So uh, th this really drove a lot of our, our subsequent development effort when we realized that. So first on catheters, um, if you've ever worked with catheters or endoscopes, the problem is you wanna push a rope. In other words, you want it to be flexible so it can move through these tortuous paths, but at some point you need it to be stiff enough so that it doesn't buckle. Um, and so that it can, in this case for an ablation, you actually have to provide uh, 20, 30 uh, grams of, of force in order to, uh, to get a good transmural ablation. Um, this is with the radio frequency uh, signal to, to actually kind of basically just cook or heat up the tissue a little bit to keep the, the signals from flowing. So, so this is a challenge. How do you push your up? How, what do we really needed was a catheter that you could change the stiffness from. So, um, in, in uh, um, one, of, one of my PhD students, Christoph Schalten, was, was, was looking at this and then went to the literature in soft robotics and realized there were some interesting materials out there um, that uh, were, would actually change their stiffness at temperatures just, above, just slightly above body temperature. So the, we use these, these materials called the liquid uh, um, low melting point alloys. Um, and so at uh, body temperatures, these alloys were stiff um, they were uh, high, high modulus, but if we could heat a particular segment of that, then that, um, and apply a magnetic field, all of a sudden it would begin to bend and it would soften and allow us to move it. And then uh, we could we could selectively heat different uh, sections of this um, and get different shaped catheters. So in a sense, it gave us this sense to create a this ability to create a robotic catheter using by just simply heating up sections of the uh, of the catheter. To just above body temperature, safe temperatures for the human body. Um, and these videos show, uh, show this experimentally. This is actually done in the Aeon Focus. And you could, uh, this, this part here is just showing the direction of the field. It's just a kind of a, a, a loosely tethered magnet that moves with the field. And you can see the different behaviors we get from that catheter. So this is some, some published work and patented work that we have. And one of the things that we were able to do was develop what we consider to be the world's smallest steerable catheter. Um, this, is, uh, this one is about a millimeter in diameter. We've made them um, down to uh, 300 microns and smaller in, in diameter uh, so that we can very, uh, create, create shapes that you simply can't create with current catheters. So that we've continued in that. We continue to work on, uh, on catheter development and I've got a, a, a small team that's that's focused on on ways of creating new and new and different kinds of catheters the other side of the coin though is the, the magnetic navigation system um, and, I, and we learned a lot of lessons uh, with the aon focus uh, there are uh, there is a commercial system out there called uh, stereo taxes out of st louis missouri and they have a, a large system and the new system on the market is called their genesis system it has an integrated fluoroscope with it um, and it has these very large magnets that are uh, very heavy uh, on the order of 200, um, over 200 kilograms each. So you're moving these large magnets. They're not electromagnets, but permanent magnets around to, to guide this. But it requires a dedicated uh, operating room. There's also a company on the market for a while called Magnetex that had another electromagnetic system. Um, but it's, uh, um, it also required a dedicated, <clears throat> um, operating room, and, and that's a, a challenge for a hospital to, to integrate and to provide space for and to get into their budgets. And, and so one of the, the AND focus attempted to address that in the sense that it, it would allow hybrid use of, of the operating room. In other words, the system could come apart and you could use 
uh, the operating room as you normally would, for instance, a normal cath lab or something like that. But we realized even this was a challenge. And so what we've done since then is we've gone to a system we call now the Navion. Um, you can see the uh, um, um, AON focuses about 7,500 kilograms. Um, our, our Navion is about 350 kilograms and is easily wheeled in and out um, uh, of, uh, and it requires just simple connections, uh, just uh, uh, 35 liter per minute of the water, uh, just tap water is fine for cooling and uh, just some special electric connections, but nothing, nothing too uh, extraordinary there. So it's easily integrated into hospital. Of course, you can imagine that not as expensive and, um, um, and allows you to perform quite a bit of, of different kinds of procedures. And so here we're, we're looking at, at a neurovascular procedure where here's the Navion up here. This, uh, all these tubes you see here is a human scale, uh, human vasculature. This is a heart. Uh, this is all the, the, the brain arteries and veins and carotid arteries coming up here. And what you see is our little flexible magnetically tipped catheter that can move up um, quite dexterously through any of these different uh, lumens up, up deep into the brain. Um, it, isn't, it, it doesn't have to have a special bent tip. It doesn't have to be uh, steered with the uh, complications that a normal catheter is normal. With the, with the normal catheter, you push, you pull, and you twist it, and you have to get the right bend at the tip in order to fit through many of these um, 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 bifurcations in here. However, with our system, uh, we could just bend it as well using the magnetic field. And as we get closer and closer, the field of strength, of course, gets stronger and we're able to, to move even more dexterously as we move here. So you can see him easily going up the aortic arch right here. So we're continuing there. And this is kind of our vision of, of uh, well, you can't see it. I guess my, my video is connecting out, but you didn't miss much there. Um, Anyway, uh, we've also been looking at these in gastroenterology, and so this is a, you know, obviously a 3D printed stomach here, and this can be easily inserted either through the nose or, or uh, the esophagus or through the mouth um, down into the stomach and do an, a, a quick and easy scan. And remember now, we don't need these kinds of pole wires to bend it. We're using the magnetic fields, and so without those pole wires, that means we have a lot more space in the lumen. We can fit tools and things in there, um, and we can also uh, make it much more flexible, so we can make these actually safer. So we think there's a lot of uh, a lot of benefits for this technology. I think there's a lot of benefits from the manufacturing cost side of it, from the safety costs, which will help the regulatory uh, issues as well. Um, so we think it's a, it's a good story. It, it solves a lot of issues uh, um, and, and kind of moves things further down down the path. Remember, this all started from trying to control micro robots. So keep going there. But I want to tell you about uh, what happens when we go smaller. Okay, how do we make micro robots? What can we do if we're making devices that can swim through your smallest blood vessels, the things that are the size of red, of uh, uh, red blood cells? So. One of the challenges as we go smaller comes back to those two physics equations I showed you at the beginning on torques and forces, and you saw that volume term in there. And of course, that means as we go smaller, uh, volumetric uh, quantities or the importance of those are dropping off tremendously. Um, and so we had to reconsider ways as we get really small of making, of making small um, micro robots move. And so we became interested in bacteria. And this, is a little animation. This is a, a model of an of E. coli bacteria. It's about one to two microns long. They were first discovered, bacteria were first, first uh, reported to be seen um, in 1675 by Anton von Leeuwenhoek when he was practicing with these new mag microscopes that had been uh, invented earlier in the 1600s. Um, and when he looked under pond water, he would notice these little things he called animacules that seemed to have these little tail-like structures that would swim around. And for about 300 years, people just thought these were some kinds of uh, sperm-like structures. But it wasn't until almost 300 years later that Howard Berg discovered that they actually were rotating their, um, they had a rotary motor that would rotate this flagella. So it had a helical kind of flagella, which was astounding at the time to think that nature had evolved a true rotary motor. And these rotary motors, uh, if you call I mean, the, the uh, flagella will spin around you know, they could spin at 200 RPM or more, but the motors, if they were, if they had no load on them, could go over thousands of RPMs. They're, they're driven by protons. Um, it's a fascinating uh, molecular structure, molecular machine. Um, if you're interested, I encourage you to take a look because it's uh, uh, 
uh, it's it's really a, an elegant, uh, evolved uh, natural design. So it's, it's, it's astounding. Now we looked at those motors and realized we don't have technology for that. But one thing we did have technology that was similar that remind us was a, a cell scrolling technique where we could create these corkscrew-like structures, these helical structures similar to what bacteria flagella look like. Um, and so with Li Zhang and, and some of my uh, some of my folks in the group at the time, we, we, took, we looked at these structures we were just kind of playing around with for fun and we realized, you know, they're a lot like bacteria flagella. And if we can put a little bit of a magnet on the end of it, and then we put it in a rotating magnetic field, we could generate a torque on this, um, which theoretically should create a propulsive force um, and let it move forward, just like real bacteria do, just like we see with uh, flagellated E. coli and, and, and salmonella and some of these bacteria that, that use these rotary motors. Um, and so we were able then to, to master the fabrication process and, and developed in, in 2007 the first artificial bacteria flagella. Here you see three of them swimming. These guys are about 50 microns long. Um, and that ribbon is about 20 nanometers thick or so. Our first ones were made out of uh, silicon, silicon germanium bilayer. That's the way we get them to roll up as we control those residual stresses. We also make them out of, of gallium arsenide bilayer, one of those, one of those layers we, we dope with indium, which gives a, a certain mismatch in the, in the crystalline uh, structure. So that we, and if we precisely control all these crystal planes, we can get it to, to, to move in, to, to work squirrel into this kind of a structure. But over the years, new technologies became available, for instance, direct laser writing in the nanoscribe. And so we're able now to make these out of polymers. We're able to write, uh, 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 use direct laser writing techniques to do this. Um, and then put, again, putting magnetic material on them or embedding magnetic beads in them, we're able to then create, uh, these, these guys are still a, a bit large. We've gotten them down to less than 10 microns in size. Uh, and we're able to uh, control swarms of these, in fact. So, uh, um, and in fact, we uh, found ourselves uh, in the Guinness Book for World Records for the smallest medical robot, or the sm smallest robot for medical use, uh, 2012. Um, and, and as I mentioned, we're making these pretty small. This micrograph, this, this uh, uh, image here is a, of a human hair. Uh, these are some of the smallest ones we made in comparison to that, and they're about the size of a red blood cell. So uh, we've, we've gone down a lot of paths. We've got a lot of a lot of research on these material properties, um, on making uh, how we can make these bio erodible and biodegradable, so that they can operate in your body for a while and then just disappear. We don't have to worry about trying to get them out. Uh, and we've also functionalized them. And so uh, uh, some years ago, we uh, functionalized uh, them with a near infrared dye. We took, and so we took 80,000 of our little ABFs. Uh, we injected them into a living mouse, into its peritoneal cavity. We call these an FABS for a functionalized ABF. So they have this fluorescence on them. And then um, if you get 80,000, you get a strong enough signal to actually uh, see this with a fluorescent microscope. And so we could inject this uh, this swarm into there and then drive them around within the within the living mouse. So uh, that's what these videos show. These are the, the fluorescence images. This is in a petri dish, just, just to give an idea of how they what it what it what it looks like inside or what we imagine it looks like inside the mouse. Um, and then these are the uh, the swarm of them being moving around inside. So you can imagine uh, uh, them carrying some kind of a drug or a payload and targeting a tumor or something like that there. Uh, but, but these robots are still relatively uh, stiff. Even though the polymer, they're made out of polymers, it's still relatively stiff and, and rigid devices. And so we became interested in softer devices. You know, this area of soft robotics has become quite popular. Well, we became interested in soft micro-robotics. And so Henry Wong, one of my students, uh, uh, was looking at this. Uh, we were giving it some thought of what we might do and became interested in a parasite uh, that's called Trypanosoma brucei. Um, and what's interesting about this parasite is uh, that it, it changes its morphology from a long slender form to a stumpy form. And it does that at various points in its life cycle. When it has to move, it's long and, and thin and slender so that it can wiggle uh, like, a, like a flagella or a microorganisms can swim. When it doesn't need to, it becomes into stumpy form and just kind of sits there. And what this, um, um, 
parasite is responsible for it. It's responsible for a horrible disease called trypanosomiasis, or uh, also known as African sleeping sickness. And it, it resides in the tsetse fly. And then when the tsetse fly bites a human, um, it moves into its bloodstream and then is able to move across the blood-brain barrier into brain tissue where it, it creates this, this uh, sleeping disease that's, that's deadly, a horrible disease. Uh, but but the, the morphology changes through its life cycle are what interested us. And so um, we were curious if we could build a robot to do that. And so Henley uh, and some of my, the others in my group developed a, a bilayer approach uh, with different uh, mechanical properties of these, of these thin films. Um, in, in one of these films, in one of these layers, they embedded graphene flakes. Now, the graphene is, uh, absorbs infrared light quite well and heats up. And so uh, what we could do then is in our lungs, we could have it in a long slender form. And then when we triggered this by shining a little infrared laser light on it, um, that graphene flakes, graphene would absorb the light, heat up, and would cause then a, a, a swelling of one side of the, uh, uh, of the polymer bilayer, um, and it would create this, what, what's called the stumpy form. And so by transitioning between 25 and 45 degrees C, we could go from a long slender-like uh, device to a, to a stumpy device. So you can imagine now with drug delivery, why you might want to do that. You would want your drugs to be able to move at certain times, but then when they got to where they needed to be, they trigger something to cause them to stop moving. So that was the thought there. But the other thing that was, that was nice about this uh, uh, project was that it, we, we created this nice uh, fabrication procedure that allowed us to make a variety of these soft microrobots, a, a variety of different kinds of, of devices that uh, exhibited this. And so then we could, you know, and we're also, remember, at low Reynolds number of flows here. So the, you know, the, the mathematics, is, uh, the physics is somewhat tractable. So we could actually do some interesting optimization and, and, and understand it from, a, from a, a deeper viewpoint. So we could, we could try out different designs. We could actually fabricate those and then get uh, uh, experimental data uh, to verify that they're swimming the way we want. So we can optimize for different things, for instance, locomotion speed and things like that. So, so very... Uh, uh, fun, interesting uh, I, uh, area. Uh, it's all low Reynolds number uh, fluid dynamics, so it's tractable. You can get a, you can get your head around it, and um, um, with just some simple analysis, it's 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 really been, I think, intellectually very satisfying to see this connection between uh, nature and and being inspired by nature. Uh, understanding the physics of the fluid dynamics and, and magnetism at these scales, and then trying to bring that together with our fabrication techniques and, and, and bring them all together into this, uh, this, this whole idea. Um, but we, uh, you know, one of the things about these devices is that they don't have a lot of autonomy. You really can't program them. You build them and they sit there. And so we've been thinking for quite some time, how could I program one of my uh, micro or nano robotics, robots? What, what could I do? Um, and so we, uh, we worked with uh, a group at the Paul Scheer Institute here in, in one of our government labs here in Switzerland with Laura Heiderman's group, and she's an um, expert on nanomagnetics. Um, and, and one of the things we learned from, from Laura was uh, uh, about, about nanomagnets was that as you look at magnet sizes, at large sizes, you can have multiple domains, and those can get magnetized in different ways. And there's a whole theory about that. You take my microbiotics course, and I can. We, we spent a lot of time talking about that. At very, very small scales, uh, they're all single domain, and that's when they're super paramagnetic, and of course they forget their magnetization as soon as you turn off the field, and that has certain advantages. But there's this transition region in here where you, we create these, we call them racetrack shapes. Uh, they're kind of these elongated oval shapes. And um, what, what becomes interesting is the coercivity of these uh, you know, here there's no coercivity because they're super paramagnetic. They, they simply forget that they were magnetized as soon as you turn off the field. Um, but there's this range in here where these, these structures, if you choose the right material, their, their coercivity changes depending on their size. So we can actually create magnets of the exact same material that have a different coercivity. And that's uh, evidenced in this anisotropy uh, uh, curves that we have here, these uh, magnetization curves. Um, so, so that gives us a way then, um, I'm, I'll go into this in a little bit more detail, that gives us a way to program. So we can actually, and I'll, I'll talk about that in a little bit, but if we then can take a, um, 
a uh, soft structure, a structure that's bendable, and um, and put different size magnets, uh, different size nanomagnets on different locations here, then by exposing by by some, uh, exposing the entire structure to different fields, different strength fields it, it, in, in different orientations, we can actually program the exact same device to behave in different ways in different magnetic fields. So we're able to program uh, you know, the, mag the magnetization of, of this panel to be along this direction and this panel along this direction, uh, this one along this direction and this one along, along this direction. And we can flip those as we want. And as we flip those by exposing particular size fields to this, this device, we can change its programmability and we can start making complicated structures. Uh, you know, we call these you know, called origami because it's kind of a folding like structure and get it then to react differently to different magnetic fields. And so um, um, this, this kind of shows this in more detail. We've got these four panels. Uh, uh, Two of them are the same. Uh, these two panel one and one and panel are, are the same size magnets, but at different orientations in the same with panel two. And then by select by carefully exposing this to to fields of different orientations and different strengths, I can get this guy to remember his magnetization. He's going to remember it here, but this guy's going to get flipped, and so on here. Um, and then create from these four panels. I can, from these four panels, I can actually create 16 different magnetization configurations. So now I've created a way of programming my devices in situ by just exposing them to different sequences of magnetic fields and getting them back to, uh, as I then have them exposed to then another field uh, to get them to behave and, and show different kinds of, of shape uh, performance and these kinds of things. And so. This is, I think, the first work we've really shown that shown how you might uh, program nano machines in this way. Um, and then uh, Tian, Tian, Chen Yun Wang, one of my uh, one of my uh, uh, postdocs here, took this even further and 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 created an origami crane and and pattern these different uh, nano magnets on different so locations of that of that crane and. and and you go through and create just dozens and dozens of different types of magnetic configurations here. And here's four of the kinds of behaviors he got out of that. Uh, uh, in this case, he's, he's uh, creating a, a flapping uh, motion. So this is an origami crane that you can actually magnetically actuate. So you get it to, to flap. Um, another one in which he uh, could get it with, to, to demonstrate a turning behavior in the presence of a magnetic field. Uh, another one in which he got a uh, kind of a hovering uh, behavior that he called it, and then and then a fourth one here where he showed it, it kind of side slipping a different kind of behavior. So, again, same the same crane um, being programmed, but being exposed to different kinds of fields so that its its different body parts would react in different ways to that. So we uh, uh, that's that's in any way uh, I think uh, kind of elegant work in a way. I think there's so much more that can be done here. So, so to summarize, uh, we're excited about electromagnetic actuation. There are other ways to, to power electromagnets uh, or uh, ma micro robots. Uh, people look at ultrasound, which I think is very interesting. People have looked at chemical pr propulsion lately. A lot of work on using light to propel these, but we still think uh, electromagnetism has a lot of uh, uh, possibilities. Uh, nanomagnetism is, is quite interesting um, and enables programmable, reconfigurable, uh, micro robots. We also, I, I didn't mention it, but these two devices here are quadrupoles. So most most magnet, magnet, uh, magnetic models we talk about are dipoles, but in this case they're quadrupoles. Um, so there's a lot to do there, a uh, lot to explore. I think there's still a lot of great fundamental work here. And also I think the fluid interactions um, and understanding that is just fascinating. Um, bringing that together all the physics and fabrication procedures, I think those are, are fascinating. Um, and then in terms of the medical robotics side, I think there's also been some quite interesting developments. First of all, we've seen success. We're, we've seen um, positive outcomes uh, from uh, robotic surgery, but we've also seen incredible interest from investors and from the biomedical companies in this space. But these ideas do take uh, a long time to come to fruition. Um, and there's a lot of reasons for this. Uh, first of all, whenever we start a new project in medical robotics, 
uh, we always underestimate the complexity of the task, but of course, that's the story of robotics. We always think the problems are easier than, than they are. Um, otherwise, maybe we wouldn't have started in the first place. Um, one of the things that's key is we need to understand the surgical workflow. How do you integrate with the way the surgeons are used to operating, but also with, with the hospitals? Um, you have to appreciate in this space that incremental change is good. You don't want doctors coming in and doing something different, so you have to have a strategy of how to bring that along. And also, you got to be uh, concerned about business models at some point because the investments are tremendous to bring this in, uh, to bring this to fruition. And so, you got to make sure that that they, you know, there's uh, a return on the investment eventually. Make sure you're working on the right problems. Um, one of the questions we ask ourselves is, will this discipline ever impact access to su surgery worldwide? Um, I certainly hope so. I think the cost of systems must be reduced, and there's certainly plans for that, and there's certainly ways that these costs of these systems could be reduced. Um, I also think uh, one of the keys is we need to show that these systems really can help train surgeons more rapidly. Um, and, and especially during these COVID times, we're seeing the importance of remote operation of systems in telemedicine. And I think when we when we really can get the systems at lower price points, we can show that that we can democratize surgery in the sense that you don't it doesn't take 20 years of training before you can really perform some of these surgery you can come in sooner with that and 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 use experts remotely to guide this i think these are the kinds of things that uh, are going to change the field uh, in in a more global sense rather than the way we see it now so that's all i have to say i i thank you very much for your attention i'm going to uh, leave it here and this is a little video um, in a fluoroscope, uh, x-rays, and this is a, a 3D printed circle of wills. This is the, the uh, circulating anastomosis that's inside your brain that delivers blood flow, and what I'm showing is moving a little device uh, through that. Uh, what's important about this is that the system that's doing that is an electromagnetic system that allows actually a whole human in it, so we can actually control devices uh, at human scales there. So that's uh, that. there. I thank you very much for your attention, and um, uh, wish I could be there in person with you. So, okay, thank you. thank you. Okay, thank you, thank you very much, Brad, for your great uh, talk and uh, plenary. We are really impressed uh, about your work on uh, these micro robots, uh, nanomagnetics, and seems that uh, this electro electromagnetics is very important to to you know to control, to steer, and to make. Uh, these uh, robots uh, moving, uh, you know. So now, um, and I'm also very impressed about uh, the, the the level of uh, engineering uh, that you did in order to make uh, these uh, these ideas into into real uh, uh, devices. I saw the Octomag uh, uh, story, you know, going to the to the to the recent uh, to the very recent uh, um, years in some sense. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a, uh, it's it's really, it's really, really, really nice. So now we have we have time for questions. I'm going to open uh, the questions will be given by um, by chat. Okay. So one of the Alessandro Monticelli uh, is uh, is asking about the artificial intelligence applied to micro robots and now uh, this field is going to evolve in the in the next few years so what's the the, the joining uh, aspect between ai and this uh, micro machinery that you are doing for micro and nano robots actually okay so um I uh, am excited about, about what we're going to see first of all in medical robotics so let's talk about what's already in the clinics uh, at, at larger scales and what you what certainly the trends in the field are we will see more and more autonomous behaviors that is uh, right now uh, all of the operations are uh, all the movements are, are directly controlled closely by a surgeon we're going to see uh, in the not too distant future more of these automatically controlled or parts of them automatically controlled. For instance, endoscopes. I think we will see endoscopes that will be automatically controlled to make sure for if you, for instance, scan your stomach that it, it reaches the whole area instead of um, uh, some of the problems now with, uh, with scans. Uh, for instance, if you have gastric bleeding is that the, uh, uh, the person controlling the endoscope sometimes is, misses, misses the bleeding. And, and so 
we will give more and more control. And so these are, you know, classic path plotting problems, how to cover areas. Um, uh, and, and this will just continue. We, we already see this with capsule endoscopy, the, the, those pills you swallow that go through your guts where, where some of the, uh, the images are actually analyzed automatically because you're, you're ending up with tens of thousands of, you know, 50,000 images to analyze. And it's hard to do that for a surgeon, so for, for a person. And so some, we'll see more autonomy there. Yeah. For microbiotics, yeah. For microbiotics, it, it's it's going to be similar though. You need to plan, and in in you know, I I, I think my students see uh, and the way we work, we you know, we think of of, of the the kinds of algorithms we use are are very very similar to the same kinds of algorithms used for self driving cars, um, yeah. yeah, for mobile robots. Yeah. So I think we'll just see more and more of that coming in. Yeah. So uh, another question that I have, why we, we accept uh, some other questions from the, from the audience is that, uh, so you were showing, the, so one of the main uh, way that you were showing is to use uh, um, magnetic fields to, to, to steer and orient the robots. But at a certain point, you also showed the swarm of robots. So how do you manage to, if you want to control two robots uh, in, uh, you know, in, in a sort of cooperative, uh, uh, cooperative way with different trajectories. So how can you do multiple control of different robots with the same? Yeah, um, so there's a, you know, there's a robotics problem called uh, one command to many robots, right? Uh, yes. um, and, you know, and one, of, one of the people I, I used to read a lot of his papers is Tim Brattle from, um, from University of Illinois, um, where imagine you have many, many robots and you can give one, and they're all at different um, initial configurations and you can give one command you can actually plan that command to get configurations. And, and I think theoretically, that's a really interesting problem. Um, but another way to think about the, this though is, you know, we're used to thinking in, in terms of robotics that every single one of our robots has to reach its goal. Um, but with, with swarms, we have to think in a more statistical sense. Uh, we want to look at uh, how, you know, a certain percentage getting there. Um, and, and so we need to, to rethink how we, we do the control of that. And, and I think, you know, we have the tools in robotics to do that. We just need to adjust our thinking and, and, and go down that path. So I think there's some, some really interesting uh, uh, theoretical work to do there and experimental work. Good. So some other question from the, from the audience. So there was a, um, okay, what do you think about silicon and the micro machining as a process to build micro robots? Do you think that it can be still useful for surgical applications? Yeah, I, so I, I, you know, it depends on what you want to. So if 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 you're on a catheter, you know, or, or something that you can control very precisely, you can put in and take out. Then you know, all you need to do is to make sure that you have short-term biocompatibility. That your you you know, neodymium iron boron, for instance, one of the magnets that's used for the catheters, is a toxic material. Um, yeah. But you can coat it. Um, so if, if, if you're just putting it in and taking it out, that's okay. If yeah. you're going to leave it in the body, even if it's coated, that's, you know, that's just, uh, not going to go anywhere. And I think that's one of the things, whenever you look at, at robotics research, look, ask yourself what materials are being used. And, and to me, there's, there's three main properties we're concerned about. Uh, first, in, in micro robots is biocompatibility and biodegradability. We want materials that can, if they stay in your body, aren't going to hurt you. Um, yeah. um, the other thing is magnetization. We need good magnetic properties. Um, and those two are, are uh, I won't say completely conflicting, but, but, but you've got to be very careful to, to do that properly. Um, and then the third is, is the functionalization, the surface properties of these, which includes things yeah. like surface tension, surface wetting, how you can attach molecules. And so those three things are key material properties. And uh, I've got a, you know, a, a great uh, professor I work with here, Salvador Pane, and, and these are the things we, we talk about a lot and try to figure out new material systems in those, in those areas. Well, Brad, then I have another curiosity that, I mean, I was really impressed by artificial bacterial flagella, no? That had a sort of uh, this propeller to, to way to move. And then you build uh, some, uh, nano robots with uh, very similar behavior with magnetic uh, you know you were rotating so in, in some sense you get inspired you got inspired by the the, the some by the nature and you build something with the, these machines how, how far we are i mean are you investigating the engineering of the molecule itself 
to you know to try to to being uh, not to change the domain but staying uh, in the in the cell in the biology basically yeah so something that is uh, triggering your brain i mean interesting yeah. you is there some you know, about about ten years ago, I I, I had a, a plan to move into this. You know, molecular machines. I think I think it's a fascinating area. Not not just the bacterial motors, but uh, um, all sorts of all sorts of fascinating mole uh, molecular machines. And uh, went down that path, um, and then uh, things didn't work out. But I, if I were to start my career over again, um, you know, if I were just finishing my PhD and looking at building a lab. I think working on on understanding that from an engineering perspective would it, it, it's such a rich area and and so intellectually fun to work in. Um, but right now, uh, you know, I'm uh, looking at more more immediate uh, systems that can get translated. So I'm looking at, at maybe nearer term solutions. Uh, so then I I think more of an and more as an engineer. Um, but I. I uh, I'm, I, I think it's a great area, and I think there's not enough engineering in this area. There's a lot of science. There's a lot of understanding uh, how these things work, but how do you duplicate uh, that? How do you use these molecules? Uh, I think there's, uh, I've thought this for years. I've thought this for over a decade. There's, there's a lot to be done here. Okay, Brad. So there are just a few comments. So there was a comment about uh, the interdisciplinarity of the field. So it's control engineering, biomedical engineer. Of course, this is very interdisciplinary field and just the answer that Brad said about biology adds another component to it. And also there was a question about how to monitor adverse events, but I guess that is similar to other uh, you know, procedure that we have in surgery, right, Brad? Yeah, well, I think um, this, you know, as you go through a regulatory process, when you really look at, at you know, it's one thing to, to do the experiments in your lab and to publish a paper, but it's another thing to actually take it uh, um, into the clinic. And so you have to go through a particular process, regulatory process. And one of the key parts of that is uh, doing your risk analysis. Um, yeah. And and these have to be very detailed risk analysis. What's going to what what could possibly go wrong, and how are you going to how are you going to recover and mitigate that? And um, that's what makes it so uh, challenging uh, to 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 take this technology and 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 get it. And you really have to think. Um, yeah. Uh, first of all, you know, in in that. Otherwise, you're um, you'll never get through the regulatory process. And and I think that's. That's what we worry about. That's why we have to first use the right kinds of materials, and then we also want to think about uh, what procedures we're doing and what can go wrong, and how are we going to stop that. So, <clears throat> good, Brad. It was a, a real pleasure to have you with uh, with us, and uh, I mean, we will get really inspired by your take home message from your plenary. And I wish to thank you um, from myself and uh, Barbara and all the other organizers of the of the conference and thanks again for participating to uh, to our to our conference thanks Brad. Thanks, thanks Barbara thanks everybody for watching next time <clears throat> bye bye take care bye so the session ends and we will keep going with the regular sessions that should have been started five minutes ago but we will uh, uh, get in time later bye bye